Good morning to all of you. My name is Sebald Noorda. I've been asked to share the first panel of today. Uh, the first panel will last for about one hour from now on. We have three panelists whom I will shortly um, introduce. We will have a conversation with those panelists in the next, say, 40 minutes. And then we will have um, an opportunity to address all sorts of questions that you as attendees are filing. If you use your questions and answers function on your screen, the bottom of your screen, you're able to file questions uh, that panelists will then um, return to later on in the panel session. This very first session, as um, said by Madame Barthes uh, earlier on, is on academic freedom uh, more important than ever. Uh, academic freedom by some um, is seen as a sort of um, evident uh, privilege of the academy, not paid much attention to. But at the same time, it's being experienced by many um, as something that is very um, precious, that is under pressure, uh, and that is in some situations very rare. Although we know that academic freedom, like institutional autonomy, are absolutely crucial uh, for the university and for the academic community to function well, uh, moral um, independence, intellectual independence from economic power and uh, political authority are crucial uh, prerequisites for a good university and for a well-functioning academic community. Although that is very true, it sometimes uh, is not seen as so important. And if it is, um, it is only discussed in very rare situations in countries with politically uh, undemocratic regimes and is not seen as a concern to all. Well, the reason we have this panel today is that academic freedom is seen as a challenge and as a uh, crucial prerequisite for good universities and for well-functioning academic communities uh, to all. Strangely enough, it is exactly the success of a university and the success of the academic work that has drawn many to control and try to control academic freedom. Um, so the university and the academic community must counteract and make academic freedom um, a true reality. And what we're going to do in this panel is look into the particular challenges of today and see how we as an academic community across Europe can act to strengthen those freedoms and to protect and help those who are victims of undemocratic regimes and unwanted pressure on academics. As I said, we have three panelists. First of all, Philippe Aguillon, uh, Philippe is professor at the Collège de France, where we had planned to be today. Um, Philippe, um, uh, heartily welcome. Uh, you're a professor of economics, both at the Collège de France and at the London School of Economics, I believe. And then we have Professor Katrin Kinzelbach, formerly of the Global Policy Institute in Berlin, now a professor at the Friedrich Alexander Universität in uh, Erlangen-Nürnberg. Uh, in human rights and particularly active in monitoring uh, academic freedom across the world. And last but not least, uh, Michael Murphy from Ireland, uh, president of the European University Association. I'm very pleased that all three of you could make it. Um, and um, um, I would like you to um, be an active uh, participant in our panel. Um, one warning um, before we start, um, like in reality, being pointed and short um, is, um, is most welcome. And on the screen, was, one must be even more pointed and shorter than in real life. So I hope I may count uh, on your collaboration in that part. We have 
um, um, about 40 minutes for our panel discussion before we turn to the questions and the answers. I would like to start with a more or less general opening question to all three of you. Um, how would you describe the particular challenges to academic freedom under the present circumstances? The health restrictions, the travel restrictions, uh, the pandemic uh, that is happening right now. Are, is this situation posing uh, special challenges? And if so, what are they? Michael, what would you say? Um, well, obviously, the, our, our freedom to do what we normally do as academics is clearly very much um, restricted, or particularly in the area of uh, scientific research. Uh, it's not possible to uh, go to laboratories, but that's a physical constraint, not a political one. Um, but beyond that, I would have thought that the, what we're seeing are risks that are magnifications of uh, challenges that we have always um, encountered. Uh, firstly, in many countries, we have emergency legislation and regulations. And in country, many countries, the governments have taken direct control of campuses. So a worry here is that post the crisis, that powers taken onto un governments may not be restored back to pre-COVID conditions. So that is something we have to monitor very carefully. A second worry I have is that um, our scientists will be subject to uh, challenges they are familiar with, um, that is um, uh, more control of their freedom to express themselves uh, in collaboration with governments and pharmaceutical companies that see enormous profit and power opportunities arising from vaccine development. Uh, and uh, so uh, that will be particularly acute given the scale of the incentives um, a third one that worries me, of course, is within the university sector, um, is that uh, the academic community may not be as wise as it needs to be in how it conducts its science and how it communicates to society. Um, we've seen examples of uh, major public pronouncements by scientists that were not then uh, followed up by evidence of quality of their studies. We see peer review processes being short-circuited and thus retractions lead to uh, credibility loss. And the fourth one that strikes me, of course, is that there will be a lot of post-mortems conducted in coming months and years on public policy decisions. And governments will be acutely keen to restrict the ability of universities, particularly social scientists, I fear, and we, we know that already from one part of the world, uh, they, they will not be keen to see us uh, using our microscopes as we have in the past to examine the uh, propriety of decisions they have made. So there are four key thoughts that come to my mind linked to the virus. Thank you very much, Michael. Katrine, what would you like to add to this? Okay, well, thanks uh, for, for being here, first of all, and greetings to the big audience, which is very impressive. I agree with Michael on many of the points that he made, and uh, maybe first a more hopeful message. I think we uh, have seen that um, academics inside and outside of universities are really playing a vital role in addressing the current crisis, not only from the epidemiological point of view, but also in terms of its social, economic, political and cultural dimensions. Um, and I think that's uh, an, an important message that actually academics are needed uh, for addressing this crisis. We have also seen in recent months that deliberate interference with the dissemination of scientific data or the deliberate distortion of information puts people at risk. And this demonstrates that academic freedom and of course freedom of expression matter to everyone. And in a crisis, it can literally help to save lives. And uh, as we see pressures on academics, um, we must realize that this freedom won't come automatically. It is a freedom that has to be actively protected, actively promoted, and sometimes struggled for. And I do believe that we will see in some countries that under the pretext of crisis response, some new pressures on academic freedom are arising and will continue to arise. 
Okay, thank you very much, Katrine. As Katrine just said, universities are seen as vital um, functions in society these days. Um, you see more scientists on television screens uh, than ever. And at the same time, um, one could worry um, that when we want to look back to the, to, the, to the present crisis in a couple of months and freely criticize governments, international organizations and colleagues, uh, that that welcome role of scientists uh, might uh, be thwarted and that it might be not, the, the public might not be that um, um, welcoming uh, to critical remarks. And at the same time, we see the danger uh, that a situation of control um, will continue to be uh, operational and will continue uh, to have an effect on scientific life, um, not just on the part of government, uh, but also on the part of industry, uh, where industry um, uh, interests are um, at stake. Um, is there, um, um, uh, panelists, a, a special reason um, why it is that university people, academics in general, uh, do not seem to care so much about, about academic freedom? How, why is it that this, 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 this necessary uh, pre prerequisite, this, this, this absolutely crucial element of university life um, is so underrated? Philippe, would you like to address that question and unmute yourself? Can I put some slides on? Yes, go ahead. Uh, let let me share there are slides. not too many. So, in fact, you see the innovation process uh, is typically uh, a multi-stage, uh, is typically a multi-stage process. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the very early stages uh, uh, typically are done under freedom. Freedom is important because we don't know what we are researching. Uh, we, we want to be free to pursue ideas. And, and that freedom is, is crucial. If you work in a firm, a firm will tell you what to do because the firm will want you to focus. The other thing also is that the firm will want you to be proprietary. They say you can't interact the way you want because we don't want our ideas to disseminate, to be stolen by someone else. So if you do research within a company, you will be restricted, your freedom will be restricted. You may get higher pay, but in exchange for the higher pay, you will have lower freedom. So it's very important that the early stages, the basic research in particular, be performed in places where you have freedom and openness. And the freedom and openness, that's what universities give you. So it's absolutely crucial. If you didn't have the freedom and openness, you, you would not go into the later stage of innovation. The big problem in my government or my country is that they believe that innovation, to do innovation, you just need to make an agreement with some big large companies and you don't need to put much money in, in universities. You know, the, the France suffers from being very poor universities because the French government has not understood that basic research is crucial to the innovation process and that's the freedom and openness that university gives you. That you need well-governed and well-funded universities in order to, be, to have success. You would not have the Silicon Valley without Stanford. You would not have Route 128 in Boston without MIT and Harvard and BU. And, and that's, uh, that's what I wanted to, to, uh, to talk, tell you about. Too. The importance of universities and academic freedom in the innovation process. Okay, thank you very much. You made a clear point. Michael, why do you think that academic freedom as a crucial uh, prerequisite for academic community work and academic research and teaching is somewhat underrated, it seems, in the academic community itself? Sorry, the circumstances, uh, Cybold, of course, vary very much from country to country, region to region. Uh, in some um, there is a liberal and very tolerant uh, set of societal rules, and so the matter doesn't arise, except in uh, when crises arise. Um, 
And the second, I think, is that um, the influences are often very subtle and covert, um, though very great. I mean, I, uh, Philippe has just actually signaled two sectors in particular, government and business. Um, and there is no doubt that uh, in those of us living in reasonably comfortable legislative frameworks, we are missing the growing covert manner in which the state is determining what we do. And that is through the application of accountability and accountability frameworks. Uh, the law will state that we are free, but the requirement for a university to sit down annually and discuss its performance compact with the state and the manner in which the state is increasingly top slicing our what used to be uh, direct block grants, uh, which we were free to use uh, as we wished, that are now constrained uh, through top slicing and performance compacts to very much focus what we do and uh, eliminate things that we would like to do. That's on the government side. And the second, of course, which is uh, also often uh, covert, not noted by the academic community generally, is the growth in our dependence on connectivity with business, which is valid in terms of our, our role in society to prepare people for the workforce as well as life. Um, that funding, which is increasingly important in many countries, is, doesn't come free. And there will be covert uh, limitations arising on what we can and cannot do in the sector. So um, I think it's a matter of the, the subtlety of the influences as they grow that have still not struck the community at large. Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I remember the famous German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche writing that it's often more, more difficult to discover truth in comfortable situations than in dangerous situations. When danger looms clearly, um, people know they are at risk. Uh, but when that seems to be away, um, the awareness um, is slow and sleepy. Katrine, yeah. um, yeah. um, I know that you are uh, with partners um, presently working on uh, actively monitoring the situation in terms of academic freedom worldwide. Um, could you uh, give us a short description of that work and, and tell us how that is impacting uh, the need to create higher degrees of awareness of academic freedom and its crucial value? I will do so in a second, if I may, just in reaction to the discussion just now and building off your point, Theobald, we in the human rights community speak a lot about the possession paradox. So if you enjoy a particular freedom, you don't uh, take note of it, you don't take it very seriously. And I think in this panel we have... Ex excuse me, I missed that point. Uh, what kind of paradox? A possession paradox. So uh -huh. you start to take freedom what, seriously what you have, you don't miss. when you no longer have them. Yeah. Um, and I think in this panel we have four speakers who obviously come from very comfortable situations where academic freedom is fairly well respected. And if we speak to our colleagues who work under different circumstances, I think they take academic freedom very seriously. But of course, it's also one of the least well-known human rights, much less uh, well-known um, than, for example, freedom of association. And this is because we don't teach it. So we have to teach academic freedom in every uh, you know, university education. On our project that you already mentioned, the Academic Freedom Index, let me just say a few words and I know I have to be brief. It's a collaborative project that we initiated almost three years ago. We worked with a think tank in Berlin called the Global Public Policy Institute, as well as uh, crucially with the Scholars at Risk Network and the Wiedem Institute at the University of Gothenburg. The index is based on expert assessments. So far, 1,810 coders from around the world have contributed 110,000 observation points for the period 1900 to 2019. And colleagues from the Comparative Constitution Project at the University of Chicago and Texas contributed data on constitutional protections for academic freedom around the world. So we have a de jure measure and uh, de facto assessments. 
Um, and I think uh, what we produced here is a very large data set, which is publicly available. It allows us for the first time to compare how well countries protect academic freedom and crucially to understand trends over time from 1900 until today. And this means that the data set opens new opportunities for empirical research on academic freedom, but it's of course also a useful tool for university administrations, policymakers, research funders, and activists okay, that work to promote and protect okay. academic freedom. Now, I can go into the details, okay. but maybe um, well, see first maybe. what are the particular aspects that you would like to hear about. Well, maybe you could, you could give, um, um, just to illustrate what you meant, a clear example of what you meant by both the de facto and the de jure assessment? So um, the, the de jure assessment is only an initial indicator for constitutional protection. So we look at whether the constitution of a particular country in a particular year since 1900 uh, expressly protects academic freedom. Um, and for the de facto one, we are asking coders around the world who are usually themselves employed in the academic sector to code the freedom to research and teach the freedom of academic exchange and information, institutional autonomy of universities, the freedom of academic and cultural expression, and also campus integrity, which means the absence of surveillance and other forms of security infringements. Um, and so this is really a question of how well protected, in fact, not just in law, is academic freedom around the world. And I take it that your results will be widely published, so it will be accessible uh, to all that are interested. It already is accessible. I'm happy to, in a minute, uh, and after I stop talking, to share a few links where everybody can check out not only our report, but in fact also a website where all the data is accessible, also all the raw data. So for people who want to do statistical analysis with it, you know, this is all available. Um, and uh, we very much hope that academics will use it. We also hope that maybe people from this audience will contribute to next rounds of data collection as experts. I will also share a link where you can sign up if you're interested. Um, and of course, policymakers um, can use this data too. I think what it tells us is that in historical comparison on global average, academic freedom is actually much better protected than for the longest period in the last century. But we are not at the top of the scale. So it means on global average, there's still room for a lot of improvements and there is a slight deterioration in the last few years. Of course, we have also recorded deteriorations in specific countries. And I would just like to mention uh, the most dramatic deteriorations that we recorded in the last five years occurred in Benin and Brazil, in the Chinese territory of Hong Kong, in India, in Libya, in Pakistan, Turkey, Ukraine, and Yemen. And there are a number of other countries that were already low on the scale and uh, uh, there were no further deteriorations. So I think again, and Michael also mentioned this, the circumstances really differ from country to country and we have to therefore specifically look at those country circumstances to see where levels of change might be. Okay, thank you very much. Philippe? You like to add to this? Uh, it's very interesting. China is a country that wants to be at the forefront of innovation. Um, but on the other hand, uh, they are limiting more than ever uh, freedom. So uh, it's a big challenge because they uh, frontier innovation requires freedom because you don't know what you are looking for. You have to be free, open to interact freely, uh, and uh, they are restricting that. But at the same time, they pretend and they want to be frontier innovators. So China is getting into a contradiction because they want to do something, but they shoot themselves in the feet. I wanted to share screen again and just show you some, uh, uh, so, uh, 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 some picture about China innovation. So China, they are doing a lot of patents. But the patents that they are doing, uh, 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 you see uh, the US patents here increasingly are cited outside. That's what you see on this graph. 
If you look at the share of, of Chinese patents that are cited outside China, it's going down. Right? It's going down because China patents more and more. But the patents that China does are okay patents, but they are not they are in proportion. They are not as good so far as the patents uh, that the U.S. does in terms of citation. And uh, it will be very interesting to see whether this trend reverses. Uh, my feeling is that without freedom, China will not be able to be as good uh, a frontier innovator as other countries, uh, uh, you know, in particular OECD countries. So that's the kind of, uh, uh, that's the kind, and you can see here, uh, uh, the Chinese uh, patents have increased a lot, but they are essentially home patents and not so much foreign citation. You see, the origin of citations of, of Chinese patents are home patents, that's what you see in green, that the foreign citations have not increased so much. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's interesting because uh, if China is, in, is, is between the, 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 you know, is between the rock place, how do we say, between Anclun and Le Marteau. Uh, uh, they want to be frontier innovators, and uh, at the same time, they respect academic freedom. And I, I think that we feel increasingly uncomfortable with this, uh, trying to do, do the both. And then I wanted just to, to throw this, uh, this element into the conversation. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. That's, that's a very impress, an interesting point and brings me to, to a next specific question to, to, to all three of you. Uh, I mean, science is an international affair. And international collaboration has been growing over the last decades. Uh, yet we are confronted with countries where um, academic freedom and the freedom to research um, is much more limited than in other countries. So how do we as universities, as academic communities, uh, use our, uh, our powers and our collegiality well in uh, creating awareness, in raising uh, academic freedom around the world um, in, in the way we do international collaboration. Michael, would you like to talk to that? Um, yes, so, um, I suppose uh, two points can come to mind here. The first one is that universities are internationalized to an extraordinary degree today in terms of their connectedness to institutions in other parts. Um, and we've had the promotion of internationalization or particular models of internationalization very strongly over the past uh, 15, 20 years with, and with government support in many countries. I think what's absolutely critical is that whenever we set out to establish a partnership, either proactively or having been approached by others, that it is critical that we test the fit between the uh, arrangements under which our academic staff enjoy freedom and those that are enjoyed are not enjoyed by the other party. And I think we have to be principled in not engaging uh, in partnerships that will confer uh, value on others that do not share our principles. I think um, we have to be explicit about this and I salute those institutions that have considered opening campuses in other countries and, gotten, and invested much time and energy and finally called a halt when they have uh, learned that the uh, expectations of them in a partnership would set their values, their own values at risk. I think uh, European universities in particular need to realize that you can grow a reputation over a hundred years and lose it in five minutes. Yes. And uh, we have to be stringent in that regard. Yeah. The second point I'd make is that our international university representative bodies need to engage more effectively at a global level with peers uh, globally. Uh, and um, we need to be quite uh, assertive in those fora, are uh, certainly challenging, not in, a, in a, not in a superior or an arrogant fashion, but in being very explicit in what, uh, stating what our views are and challenging those who have um, adopted different approaches. 
Well, that looks like, like a very, um, very uh, important agenda, uh, both for international university associations and also at the national level. I know that recently the, the Flemish University Council has issued a policy on this. Uh, the German Rectors Conference has just a month ago also uh, published a paper on this. I know the Swedish uh, International Agency has issued a paper on um, academic values and academic um, um, uh, freedom as an, uh, an essential, crucial uh, prerequisite for international collaboration. So there seems to be a growing awareness uh, that we should not be blinding, um, blindfolding ourselves um, and think that everything international is good. Um, uh, I mean, you can be covering up um, um, bad habits and government policies uh, by engaging in international collaboration. That's not okay. That's not fair. Um, okay. Katrine, are you, are you discovering these threats of international collaboration as a cover-up for bad situations uh, in, your, in, in your monitoring work? We do um, mention international campuses of universities also as uh, uh, examples that need to be considered when coders rate uh, specific countries. But I'd like to actually add to the discussion on China because this is a country I have studied, uh, I know fairly well, I lived there for two years. And of course, therefore, these discussions are, are, are very close to my heart. Um, the Academic Freedom Index uh, data for China is one of the lowest in the world. And I have spoken to a number of Chinese colleagues who were very, very pleased that this reality uh, is communicated through such data, and in particular also in, 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 in what is uh, possible with this data in comparative terms towards how other countries fare. Of course, from the perspective of the party state, universities present a dilemma. On the one hand, they need the research. Uh, they need it uh, in order to advance and compete economically with other countries. But, at this, but they also are places where people come together in big groups, discuss, and maybe develop visions for an alternative future. And this is something that an authoritarian, uh, increasingly neo-totalitarian state cannot tolerate. And it is trying to manage this dilemma carefully, allowing just enough for research that benefits the party state to flourish and, and then suppressing research that is um, critical. Now, I think um, I would be a little bit less uh, optimistic than Philip that, uh, Philippe, that uh, this problem will sort of resolve itself because excellent research won't be possible in these kinds of settings. And maybe that's not what you wanted to suggest. But I do think that the globalized um, uh, scientific community really presents an advantage because the Chinese scientists have access to ideas that are developed in more free settings. And then they can pick and choose what suits their purpose. And I think we have come to a stage where we really must be quite clear that China is challenging the rules of the game and that we need a strategy on how to deal with it. Um, I think um, it won't resolve uh, itself easily. Ça va pas se and um, um, I, I really hope that the, the initiatives that uh, Subert has already mentioned will be approved and that we come to a more conscious um, approach because uh, if China, the authoritarian China represented by the Communist Party state sets the rules of the game, um, academic freedom is under very, very serious threat. Oh. And one way to maybe push against it is that we must be clear about the reputation economy that universities work in, universe, well regarded universities attract the best talents and therefore we have to really uh, reconsider how we rank universities uh, and I hope that our data on academic freedom could help to correct some of the existing very influential university rankings where Chinese uh, universities still uh, appear on top ranks. Yeah, okay, well so ranking is an important topic but also standing together I mean, can I, add, uh, can I, add something? Yes. I, I, I come to you, Philippe, in a minute. 
Um, it is important, as you mentioned, that universities stand in this together. So not one individual institution is carrying the burden, um, the burden of blame and the burden of boycotts and things like that. And if European universities stand together, they are a community um, not to be overlooked and not to be disregarded. Philippe, floor is yours. To, uh, to reinforce what Catherine said, I completely agree with you, Catherine. I think there is a, China was very smart in free riding on the freedom that we have. So they, they send students to work in Amer American or European universities. And also what they do is they, they try to attract researchers. For example, we know, uh, I, I used to say that French universities are poor. So what do China do? They push on us. I mean, they attract French researchers who are in poor academic environment. They provide money. And also another thing is that, for example, in biology, you know that the ethical uh, standards are not the same in China as they are in Europe. So uh, you want to do research on monkeys and not on mice, for example, but you go to China, you know. Uh, so, so they are very smart using the loopholes, you see what I mean? To rewind on the freedom, they have money, they have funding, and they can also play on differences in ethical standards to, uh, to free ride even better more on us. So uh, I wanted just to reinforce what Catherine said. Thank you very much, Philippe. I would like to, I'd like to, to, to repost this question uh, a little bit closer at home. I mean, it's, it's quite important to speak about Brazil, uh, to speak about uh, China, uh, and to speak about other, other continents. Uh, but at the same time, we are facing similar uh, challenges uh, on our own continent. I mean, Michael, uh, among your members, uh, you have colleagues in Hungary, uh, colleagues in Turkey, to just mention those two, who are facing these threats, um, um, especially in the last uh, three to four years, um, uh, to a remarkable high degree. Um, so how do you see this develop? And how can we, as an Inspire Europe community, stand up against those downhill uh, uh, trends? Um, firstly, by being absolutely explicit about where we stand in these matters at all times. Um, um, being, uh, keeping the matter in the forefront of public debate across the continent. Secondly, we need to uh, be more effective in, in um, influencing our own national political leaderships to take steps that uh, make it more and more difficult for the governments of the countries you are mentioning uh, to continue to succeed. In other words, make sure that governments impact on the governments, because in reality, this is not a problem in the academic community caused by the academic community uh, in those countries. Thirdly, um, uh, in uh, support in every way possible our academic colleagues within the institutions in those countries. Um, I, I, to give an example, the EUA has decided that its next, its second next annual conference is going to be in Budapest. Uh, people uh, were surprised when th that uh, decision was taken that we, our presence there might be regarded as an acceptance of the um, the, the position that universities are, are, are suffering. My position, my view of it is that you take the battle to those uh, who are causing the problem. And it is our intention that when we hold our meeting in Budapest, that the matter of academic freedom will feature high on the agenda of that meeting. So uh, it, it's, our, our role is set at different levels, institution to institution, uh, institution to government to uh, to sanction governments um, and at all times keeping the public fully au fait with the realities. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, uh, I have a, a final question to the panel um, uh, at this point. I mean we are now talking about countries, about systems, about institutions Yet at the same time as the work of our friends at Scholars at Risk is reminding us constantly, uh, there are thousands of individual colleagues uh, living under these circumstances who are particularly carrying the burden. 
how can we, um, as colleagues um, across Europe, uh, in our daily work and in our communities, support those colleagues? What is the best, um, what is, say, the first uh, two or three options we have there? Katrine. All right, well, first, just a small note on Hungary, because I've taught as a guest professor at CEU for many years. And I think this is a really good example that the topic of academic freedom really only uh, was paid attention to after the CEU was uh, deliberately attacked, a, a university which has excellent international networks. But of course, the pressure on academic freedom in Hungary, on all the other universities, had started much, much earlier. And so I think we, one of the things we have to do as scholars is to study very carefully the early signs of such pressures mounting and not only starting to look once it has already reached the extreme. And I, I actually commend the EUA of going to Budapest and, 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 and bringing um, this international attention even after the CEU was forced to leave the country. In terms of individuals, well, I think pause and uh, other programs um, uh, really are very much needed and welcome in that they provide funding, but it always requires individuals and institutions that are ready to host scholars. Um, this is not always an easy task, uh, but I, I really think that this is a responsibility that scholars have in, in, in settings where um, that is possible. Um, and I would hope that we can maybe more consciously reach out to academics in countries where we now have data that uh, academic freedom is under very serious threat, but that we don't so far see among the applicants for uh, programs um, for scholars at risk specifically. Here we have an information and a network effect. Um, and of course, um, the, the applicants are all uh, uh, scholars at risk that need support, but I think we have a responsibility to really sort of actively reach out to scholars in countries um, where we know uh, problems exist, but where we don't seem to have the networks yet to, um, you know, provide support when it's needed. Any of the other panelists who wants to speak to this individual challenge, individual scholars at risk, Philippe? Yeah, maybe, I think, I don't know, I think a lot, um, a lot has been said already, but uh, co-authoring, advising, advising students from there, uh, trying to interact, exchange, uh, you know, as much as we can, involve in research, maybe uh, uh, any, any link that can be established is important, and boycott is a very bad idea. I know sometimes in academia, there was the idea of boycott. I was thinking of Israel, uh, there's nothing to do because Israel is a free country, but I know at some moment that some people wanted to boycott. Or I think any idea of boycott is very bad because when you boycott, you boycott usually those who are for those, the, the academics. You boycott the university people and you boycott the people you don't want to boycott. I think it's very important to keep in touch with the academic community in the country and uh, involve them more. Because those are the, the seeds of freedom in those countries and uh, if they are the last people you want to boycott. I think it's very important to uh, interact with them, involve them. Uh, uh, and uh, give them access to whenever they ask you that to send papers or articles to, to respond to their mails. And I think it's important to, uh, to keep in touch, you know, and, uh, and, keep, keep, uh, and that's what's great with the new technologies is that we can now, you know, uh, at least exchange more easily uh, papers, ideas, and, uh, and disseminate more. Thank you very much. Michael? I think uh, uh, Katrin and Philippe have, have really summarized it. And in a way, the project that we're, uh, that we're celebrating, Inspire Europe Today, has an agenda which really answers your question. Uh, creating opportunity. Uh, first of all, highlighting the issue, uh, lobbying the EU and, and governments, um, creating opportunities within our campuses for um, uh, exchange of, with those staff who are being uh, constrained in their home countries, our students. Uh, setting aside funding, lobbying the EU to create scholarships within the Erasmus program. Uh, this has been an agenda of the EUA for quite a long time. And mapping the opportunities across Europe so that uh, scholars in countries that are restricted 
will be aware of opportunities that are available to them, um, supports available to them from across Europe. I, I think it's the agenda of this project, really. Okay, thank you very much. I, I am um, um, looking at the questions that um, some of our attendees have posed to us. Um, some are questions for um, more information. Uh, some have been answered by uh, links to websites and reports. Um, there's a couple of questions that I would like to, to uh, hand on to, the, um, to our panelists. One attendee says, is research from the humanities and social sciences more likely to be repressed than research from engineering and natural sciences? Um, how we deal with the variety of disciplines, Philippe. Absolutely, by all means it is. I mean, for example, China, we are talking about China. I think that, uh, you know, researchers in human science have much harder times than researchers in... Uh, and, and of course, you see, the, the ideas of China before the Soviet Union was to think, well, we don't need uh, social science. We can just give some relative freedom uh, in people who, you know, research in mathematics or physics or whatever, and uh, and we just, uh, you know, don't need social science. But we, we know that again goes back to if you want to be frontier innovator, it's very interesting to see that very often frontier innovators have been acquainted with social science during their career. It's very interesting. You know, some people might believe you don't need social science. I could just be frontier in math and that's enough. And uh, of course they have, uh, uh, the, the, the repression is mostly in social science because it's linked to politics. Uh, and we need, and that freedom in social science is key to be frontier innovator. And, and that's, uh, but the articulation is a very interesting one. But, uh, you know, in, okay, in American University, yeah, so I don't want to be too long. Okay, Catherine, a remark on this? Uh, just to react very, very briefly to what Philippe just said. I think, by and large, you, you're quite right that the social sciences are at particular risk, but I do want to highlight that it's not an exclusive risk to social sciences. Any mm. politically sensitive issue can quickly no, get you into okay. trouble, which, you know, as we currently see with the SARS virus and China, virologists cannot publish their papers anymore. This affects no. all of us. Yeah. Michael? And the restrictions um, that you're referring to, which, which I agree fully with what you've said, of course, are not just the political um, uh, restrictions. Uh, you are equally, well, not equally, but you're, you can be substantially restricted in your STEM discipline, depending on uh, the policy of funders as to whether or not your area is going to be funded, um, whether you're um, hiring practices and policies, whether you can actually uh, attract the staff that you need to advance your discipline. Um, yes, politics in interferes with the social sciences, but um, directly and indirectly, the, the, your finance, uh, your, your, the source of your finance uh, is very much a determinant of what you can or can't do in the sciences. Absolutely. Uh, th th there's a spectrum. Yes, I, and, and particularly, I, I, yes, yeah. Philippe? I want to just add something I totally agree. It's true with the, we saw with the new virus, the fact that, you know, in China it took so long to be, for information to, to circulate about it, and that was, that was not social science. Uh, uh, but uh, it's, it's true that key to the innovation process is the idea of creative destruction. Innovation is very often new people who come up with new ideas, who replace existing ideas. And typically, in countries where you have no freedom or limited freedom, the incumbents can always collude with the, with the government, with the power in place, to prevent new ideas. So it's yeah. true, it's something fundamental, that without freedom, you, you, you really stole the innovation process, because innovation is about new people and new ideas replacing existing people. But typically, in countries with low democracy, there is high corruption, that means high ability for incumbents to hang on and to prevent new ideas. And, and that's because it's too much further than, uh, than social science. Thank you very much. Uh, one, of our, one of our attendees has raised um, another point, which I think is worth um, uh, discussing. Um, she, he or she says, would, do you think, what do you think about self-censorship, especially among migrant scholars and junior scholars scholars who might, may feel insecure and unable to stand their ground on research topics. 
So is, it, is there um, this, this sort of very covert and in a way um, hardly noticed danger to academic freedom and development um, if there is not a stimulus and protection uh, to more vulnerable uh, participants in the academic community? I see you nodding, Michael. Oh, um, yes, uh, self-censorship occurs where there is insufficient confidence in the environment in which you're, you're operating, uh, that your safety, your estimate of safety is not sufficient to give you that freedom. And of course, that's the whole reason why it is extremely important in all universities that there is at all times an awareness of the need to promote the culture within the organization that people should feel safe, that there's an explicit policy within the university on academic freedom, what it is, what it isn't, how it's defended. Uh, in fact, I would recommend, I suppose from a managerialist uh, country and background as our president, um, I think that this subject should be high up on the um, university risk register. Uh, it's common practice now to have risk registers, and I suspect a lot of universities might not even have it there, but most certainly should. And all policies, contracts, and, and so on should be tested against that policy as a standard management practice within the university to create this culture um, of, uh, across the organization and a sense of safety to do freely what you believe sh you should do yeah well okay thank you very much we i have been informed that we are approaching or even have already crossed the finish line of the time uh, allotted to us this morning i'd like to thank our panelists very much for their um, their wise and clear and brief um, contributions to to our panel um, we started out um, stating that the present COVID-19 crisis may have um, um, highlighted the importance of, of science um, and may have uh, supported and, and, and made more important uh, the role that science uh, plays in all sorts of ways. At the same time, it may also pose a danger in that control mechanisms in place now for safety um, reasons uh, may remain in place uh, for other reasons. Uh, we have been underlining that freedom is absolutely essential for research and uh, successful innovation. Um, we have seen um, that the dangers and risks to uh, academics are often covert, uh, often take the shape of um, um, soft influences and self-censorship. Uh, so creating awareness uh, in our institutions and among academics is very, very important. We have stressed the importance of academic freedom and autonomy in international relations, uh, making that a, um, a real living value and an important condition for international collaboration, um, which requires more awareness and keen activities on the part of international university associations, um, and not just uh, in terms of countries far away um, or very important partners like China, but also in our own um, European uh, area. And last but not least, it is and it remains of great importance that we support and protect those individuals who are uh, carrying the burden of um, uh, repression and um, totalitarian approaches to universities and to academics. Um, thank you very much for a rich uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, I wish you all the best for the rest of the day and I wish all the best to our colleagues and the attendees to the rest of our program. Thank you very much. A sincere thanks to Dr. Mirza and all the panelists in this session for this so stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, and I wish to address to Dr. Nurda our apologies because we had a technical problem uh, and I've not been able to introduce you before the panel. And so I would like to remind that Dr. Nurda uh, is uh, the president of the Magna Carta Observatory in Bologna in Italy. The 
past president of the Association uh, of Dutch Research Universities and President Emeritus of the University of Amsterdam. Well, thank you very much. We will now take a short break and resume at 11 a.m. CET for our next session, which is entitled Researchers at Risk, Career Trajectories in Europe. We look forward to joining you again shortly and thank you very much. <laughs>